Thank you everyone for joining us for our second round of installations roundtables. With us today, we have the visionary and legendary Israel McLeod and Michael Stevenson. Um, we're really excited to have them with us. Israel's project is in District B, which I'll talk about in a second, and Michael's is in District C. Um, so the way this is gonna work, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the initiative in general, and then we will hear from the artists themselves about their projects. Then we'll have a little bit more open discussion and some Q&A. So let me screen share. Okay, so this project was made possible by the Mayor's Office of Cultural Affairs and the Houston Arts Alliance. So we really thank them for their involvement in this project um, and their support. So Installations is an initiative of 11 site-specific art projects, public art projects. Um, art League is administering it and I am the project manager, Sophie Asakura, sorry. Um, we have one art project per city council district. There are 11 of them. Um, each project is temporary. So we're, some of them, like Israel's project, has been unveiled already. Um, and they will sort of roll out over the summer and into the fall. And they'll be on view for approximately eight months. Um, so these artists were selected by an advisory committee made up of artists, curators, and art world professionals who are experts in the field. Um, this is our project team. A uh, big thank you to Flying Carpet Creative. That's Kelly O'Brien and Patrick Renner for being our fabrication managers. Our marketing managers, Chris Valdez with Laredo Street. Um, the amazing Jenny Ash and Sarah Beth Wilson at Art League have been incredible in being the backbone of this project. And then Debbie McNulty, Teresa Escobedo, and Monique Mogilka at the Mayor's Office of Cultural Affairs. Big thanks to them as well. Um, so this project embraces Art League's core values of inclusivity, creativity, and learning by supporting local artists who are culturally diverse and reflective of Houston, platforming projects that challenge traditional notions of public art, and then providing support and learning opportunities for artists. Um, some of our project goals, and this will come back in later when we're sort of talking more generally about the projects, and then also keep these in mind when the artists are talking about their projects individually, are um, we wanted to support local artists, challenge traditional <laughs> public art, reimagine public space through stories of social justice and equity, respond to specific needs of communities in Houston, spread public art, a lot of it is really um, centered in the center of Houston, um, engage and empower community members, and then unearth, reinterpret, and or platform local histories. So this is a list of our um, artists, as you can see, Israel McLeod for B and Michael Stevenson for C. So a little bit about District B. Um, Israel McLeod is the artist. District B is sort of the northeast side of town. It is, it is rather gerrymandered. Um, but Israel's project is along South Victory Drive in the median in Acres Homes. His project's called Acres Homes Rocks. A little bit about B, it's home to Fifth Ward, Cashmere Gardens, Acres Homes, Greenpoint, Greens Point, Setagast, East Tex Jensen, Pleasantville, Clinton Park, lots of neighborhoods. Um, it also has the Bush Intercontinental Airport and three com complete communities, which is a mayoral initiative. Um, those three communities are Cashmere Gardens, Fifth Ward, and Acres Homes, and all three of those are historic African-American neighborhoods. Um, specifically about Acres Homes, where Israel's project is, before it was annexed by the city of Houston in the 1960s and 70s, Acres Homes was the largest unincorporated African-American community in the Southern US, and it is still predominantly African-American, however, is now incorporated. Um, it was 56%. Um, I think the census term is non-Hispanic black in 2015. Um, and then Michael Stevenson's project is titled Pardon Me Everyone, it's in District C, um, and it's in College Park Cemetery, which is on uh, West Dallas Street. Um, District C is home to the Greater Heights, Neartown Montrose, Brazewood, 
Fourth Ward, Afton Oaks, Lazy Brook and Timber Grove, Meyerland, Brayburn, Midtown University Place, Greenway, Upper Kirby, and Rice Military Neighborhoods. And despite currently being a majority white district, um, District C contains Freedmanstown in the Fourth Ward, which is a post US Civil War community of African Americans. Um, Freedman's home, and this is specifically relevant to Michael's project, um, is home to Antioch Missionary Baptist Church, Houston's first African American Black, uh, Baptist church, and the church where Jack Yates was pastor and founder. Um, he then went on to found P College Park Cemetery, where Michael's project is, um, which facilitated the burials of freed persons and other African Americans in Houston. Um, so that's my quick intro blurb. Sorry if I spoke really fast. Um, I would like to now turn it over to Israel so that he can talk a little bit about his project um, specifically. Israel, would you like to say a few words about why um, you selected Acres Homes and South Victory and um, a little bit about how Acres Homes Rocks came to be? Um, well, first of all, thank you for um giving me the opportunity to participate uh, in this project as a whole. Uh, I'm honored and uh, I feel greatly uh, um, humbled, so to speak. Um, I initially chose Acres Home because of its, as you mentioned earlier, its, its heritage, its very rich historical uh, stamina having endured uh, many, many years of uh, the whole process of growth as Houston evolved into the great city that it is today. Uh, with its uh, neighborhoods and its residents primarily being predominantly black, of course, this is something that spoke to my own uh, ethnicity and uh, uh, who I am in terms of uh, indigenous and native son. So I wanted to do something to honor that. Um, I don't live in Acres Home, nor have I ever, but I have always more or less interacted with uh, that neighborhood as a commercial and a free art freelance artist um, for many, many years. Many uh, clients and uh, customers uh, I have serviced in that area and that community. So it was um, somewhat of a uh, epiphany, if you will, that I ended up uh, choosing that particular area of town to represent uh, in an artistic and creative way. I wanted to do something that enhanced, uh, honored, elevated the community. I wanted to do something that spoke to the uh, residents there. The response has been overwhelmingly positive uh, from the very uh, beginning, and that's something that I hoped for and uh, anticipated. And with my colleague and fabricator, and dear friend, uh, Alton Ellis, who uh, operates a company there, Ellis Ironworks, we were able to ultimately create uh, works of art that were uh, synonymous with the historical integrity of the community and the people. So my initial challenge was, what do I do? How do I approach this as an artist? Uh, from a creative standpoint. Uh, there is a well-known mural that is in place at the uh, Beulah Shepherd Library uh, at uh, South Victory in West Montgomery. So there were not a lot of structures that lent themselves to murals. So my second approach and thought was to create something that was freestanding, something that would um, have a high visibility factor. And I came up with the notion of these rocking chairs, these huge oversized rocking chairs, and thus the title, Acres Homes Rocks. Uh, that term rocks, of course, is something that I more or less borrowed from the younger generation. That's not a vernacular that you know, us older folks use, but I still wanted to utilize that in terms of not only tying in with the rocking chair concept, but also to, again, emphasize and highlight that Acres Home is vibrant, it's alive, uh, it's a pulsating community that is still very much uh, relevant uh, in its connection with the uh, metropolitan uh, city as a whole. And so I went about the business of just 
designing these chairs um, in the most vibrant and contemporary and unique way as possible so that they would be eye-catching, visually stimulating, and at the same time uh, address some of the, um, the cultural concerns as well, particularly with the one uh, Queens, uh, I think it's entitled Queen 44, and that's the one that has the silhouette of the uh, African uh, African American uh, female with, the, with this particular one you might you see here with the, the hair, very vibrantly decorated. So, and that was overwhelmingly uh, received. I, I had countless uh, uh, the women passing by giving me thumbs up, high fives, and uh, just really uh, acknowledging the beauty of it and feeling that it was for them individually which is what I really wanted to achieve in terms of my relationship to the, the residents. Uh, it's been, again, as I said, overwhelmingly positive. Um, people wanting more of the chairs. <laughs> they saying, well, why don't you just continue it all the way down the, the corridor? And uh, with so many different suggestions and um, just points of inspiration. So um, the installation as a whole has been a very positive undertaking from the very beginning. and um, as I mentioned initially, I feel very honored to just uh, be a part of it. Thanks, Israel. Um, could you talk to us a little bit about the um, Trail Riders one? The Trail Riders one, which I, uh, I think I entitled that uh, Dignity and Dust. Uh, that again is something that came from my uh, initial connection with the community. Uh, every year they have the annual trail ride and I would have clients who would seek me out and wanting me to paint and decorate their, their wagons. Uh, this was before I had any knowledge of really what the trail ride itself was all about. Um, but it was something that was born also out of my connection with my welder. Uh, uh, Elton Ellis, uh, himself a uh, horse rider and coming from uh, his father who was, I, I think they were involved with that as well. Uh, so I wanted to incorporate that. This chair actually is situated on the very block which is adjacent to uh, Mr. Ellis. He actually lives in that community. And the chair, it's, it, it was initially very interesting history about this chair. This chair was actually the base, the very skeletal base of it was started by his dad. Uh, I think around 1960 or 70, uh, he started welding something and it was just very basic and simple. And then he basically shelved it and never to touch it again. After I had designed the other pieces, and I was still trying to just figure out what I would do for uh, my final chair. Uh, Mr. Ellis suggested that, hey, you know, why not pay tribute to, you know, this particular um, uh, tradition? And then he mentioned and pointed out that his dad had started this very basic chair. And I said, okay, great. So how, why not just honor your dad, you know, as a whole? So I began to just build from that and designed the, the, uh, the huge uh, wheels and the rope. And it was, a lot of it was our interacting and just kind of uh, working together in terms of the vision. And um, we wanted to speak to that particular uh, aspect of the neighborhood because it, it's a very rich tradition. And uh, if you're familiar with it, you'll see when they ride, I think, I'm not sure of what the trajectory of it is in terms of the distance, but it's a substantial distance that they cover. And it's like these just dozens, if, if not hundreds, seemingly, of horses and uh, horseback riders, African-American riders, and, you know, of course, other uh, people as well. But it's an amazing sight to see. And they are very, very proud of this heritage. And uh, something that they participate with a tremendous amount of enthusiasm, you know, every year. So I really wanted to incorporate that. And you know, once we started working on it, it just really began to evolve in terms of um, the, the design aspect of it. So we said, well, look, why not do some horseshoes? Okay, well, why not add a, you know, a hat? And so the piece just became a very living, organic sort of uh, a focal point for our creativity and uh, it was something that I really enjoyed doing. 
Beautiful, thank you so much. Um, and everyone, if you wanna take a look at Israel's impressive and um, incredible career, you can go to his website. That's israelmccloudstudio.com, which Sarah should share from the Facebook Live or should be sharing from the Facebook Live right now. Um, I guess, thank you, Israel, for sharing. Um, and Michael, if you are ready, um, can we talk a bit about your project? Um, Michael's project has a really incredible backstory that a lot of Houstonians don't know about, um, but also one that is ongoing. Um, Michael, would you like to take it away for part of me, everyone? I think you're still muted, by the way. Absolutely. Uh, hi, everyone. And first, I just want to say, um, what a tremendous honor to um, be included on this project and a tremendous honor to be on this uh, this interview today with uh, Israel. Uh, growing up in Houston um, as, a, as a kid and as a young person, you definitely see Israel's work. Um, and as a young person, it can be pretty um, majestic. Um, and so now to be sitting on a call with you, uh, thank you. Uh, you definitely inspired a lot of uh, just my work and, and um, as an artist, and so I'm very grateful to be uh, seated on the call with you. As far as my work, um, pardon me, everyone, um, the piece is gonna be located at College Memorial Park Cemetery, uh, which is in District C. Um, it's along West Dallas Street in between uh, Shepherd and, uh, uh, gosh, Dunlap View Drive. Um, this cemetery, um, as Sophie was mentioning earlier, um, is a very historic um, Black cemetery in Houston. Um, Reverend Jack Yates is buried there, um, along with a number of other um, historic Black um, individuals that have been bedrocks for the city of Houston. Um, and what's so unique about this specific piece um, is that it references um, something that happened in this area in Houston in 1917. And so in 1917, um, something happened called the Mutiny of 1917, um, where Camp Logan soldiers um, from the Buffalo Soldiers, 124th Infantry, um, came into fire um, against Houston police officers. Um, the details of the story are pretty complex in that um, what happened um, essentially began um, from racial tensions that existed in Houston at the time that you can imagine in 1917. And so throughout this piece, um, or throughout this time period, what you have happened in, in Houston is um, soldiers that are um, essentially uh, agitated in, in a sense um, by um, Houston police officers um, in many ways by the color of their skin um, and those soldiers um, in being abused retaliate um, and in their retaliation um, lives are lost and both um, from the 124th Buffalo Soldiers Infantry um, as well as the Houston police officers and so it's a really um, terrible memory um, in that um, no one wants to really think about um, the time period that we're in that created that reality. Um, and at the same time, um, I see a lot of parallels to that time period and right now, um, and the things that happen um, between um, men of color and you know, police officers. And so um, those are some of the things that stuck out to me initially with the piece, um, with the opportunity to do work at this piece. Uh, what's also really um, interesting is that two of the soldiers um, that were a part of the 124th Infantry of the Buffalo Soldiers um, are actually buried at College Memorial Park Cemetery. And so the work that I'm referencing um, is also um, a reflection of um, the lives that were lost. Um, now, what brings it to right now, as you were saying, Sophie, is that um, the time period that this happened, you know, um, retaliation versus confrontation and provocation, um, whose fault it was, those, those, those questions, you know, will exist for a long time, but 100 years later, I think we're able to sit in space today. We can reflect and we can agree um, in general that um, hating someone based on the color of their skin um, was what initiated this issue in 1917. And so family members of the Houston 13, um, 13 of these soldiers specifically that were um, tried for um, the crimes that um, they committed, um, and since the death without the right for clemency, um, those family members, descendants of those family members are now trying to um, have their, have these soldiers' names um, pardoned from history for the crimes that they were charged for. And so the name of my work, Pardon Me Everyone, um, reflects these specific 13 indivi individuals, um, including 
um, Corporal Jesse Moore, um, who is the great uncle of Professor, An professor Angela Holder, uh, who's a professor of uh, Texas and U.S. history at uh, Houston Community College, who's a board member at College Memorial Park Cemetery, which is uh, someone that's been very instrumental in helping me with information that um, I've been able to gather um, as far as the project itself. Um, in the process of actually working with the board um, at College Memorial Park Cemetery, I've also been invited onto the board. Um, and so that's a tremendous honor um, in that I think that I'm the uh, youngest person by about 30 years or so. Um, and being able to uh, be a caretaker of a space um, that is so uniquely Black and so important um, for Black lives in the city, um, it's, it's just, it's, I don't know if I have words for it, um, but I'm very grateful for it. Um, and I'll say that this property in addition um, is extremely important for the Black community in that um, Reverend Jack Gates, as I mentioned, is buried here. Um, and with his burial, uh, you also have, uh, with this burial site, you almost have this beacon um, of the, the person and in many ways that, you know, came into Houston and helped establish um, for the Black community, um, business, um, schools, health systems, um, all sorts of um, community connections um, that the Black community needed to have in order to thrive. And so, um, because of that and because of him, um, I want to honor his life with this work by revealing on the project on July 12th, which is a Saturday. Um, and that Saturday, July 12th, actually happens to be Jack Gates' birthday, um, Reverend Jack Gates' birthday. And so, yeah, that's some uh, brief background on work. Hopefully that answers. Awesome, thank you. Um, do you want to talk about past work or your practice? Yeah. Absolutely, if you, if you can pull up um, the images um, and I'll just kind of run through them. So um, since being invited to this project, um, really majority of the work I've been doing over the last eight months has been in many ways a deep study. Um, of, and if we can go to the very first, I'm sorry, the, the opposite end of that uh, slide, I apologize. Uh, all the way down, uh, oh, that's strange. That was in order. Um, if we can go to, if you scroll up, Sophie, if you go to uh, Stevenson, Future Human, the first one, thank you. So this work right here, um, I did this work in 2017. And the reason I'm showing it is because um, it's utilizing some of the same process that I'm going to be utilizing for this installation. And so um, right now, what you see is this installation I did in 2017 for um, a store called Lululemon. Um, the work is called Future Human Being Matter. And if you go to the next image of this piece, Sophie, um, you can see the zoomed in version. Um, you see um, layers of acrylic um, stacked on top of uh, reflective material. And in those layers of acrylic, um, we CNC cut out on the word human, uh, future, and being. Now, this process is something that um, I found um, almost somewhat like an optical illusion um, upon my first creation of it. Um, I love things in repetition. Um, keeping things in simple form, um, allowing people to almost be with them in, um, uh, in somewhat of a meditative state, um, a visually meditative state was what I was trying to accomplish. And so um, with this work in 2017, um, when I was asked to, um, or when I was allowed to come into this um, 11 installations project and thinking through, you know, how do I create a work of scale um, with a process that, you know, I feel confident with, um, I went back to um, one of the first um, site-specific installations that I did which was this work and um, from there if you go to if you go back out to the gallery of images um, Sophie I'll be able to show um, this uh, piece on the this next session called uh, Stevenson go slow um, so with that, um, as I began thinking through um, this project, um, I spent a lot of time on the site itself at College Memorial Park Cemetery, um, specifically at the intersection um, where the bus station is, um, specifically um, at the intersections where um, West Dallas and Kirby meet. Um, and so much time spent at intersections and streets and traffic, what you begin to watch is just the patterns of traffic and the signage that people pay attention to. And what's really beautiful about this specific space is that you have busyness happening all around this area, but on this specific cutaway of West Dallas, 
everything seems to be moving um, very much in slow motion. And so in the process of me building this work, um, me sketching it out, me thinking through what I wanted to create, um, kind of an internal dialogue that I began to have with myself was this process of going slow, allowing the work to really um, show itself to me um, and trusting that process. And if you go to the next image, you'll kind of be able to see the zoomed in version. Um, and many people kind of, you know, know this is a crosswalk man. Um, but again, even like the utilization of hardware, what I was also doing is exploring the type of hardware that I'd be able to secure my actual art piece with um, along the perimeter fence line of College Memorial Park Cemetery. Um, and then from there, if you'll go out to the next work called Yellow Jacket, Sophie. Um, so this work is part of um, a series of works that I'm doing in kinetic sculpture. Um, this work is um, a canvas that's dyed into memory, um, suspended from an oak tree. And at the cemetery itself, um, the entire property is lined with um, beautiful historic trees. And so what I'll also be doing throughout the property um, is referencing this um, kinetic sculpture um, called Yellow Jacket to be a backing behind the fence line um, that people are able to see. Um, the reason I wanna do that is because at cemeteries, oftentimes people don't necessarily see these spaces as spaces that incorporate movement. Um, they see these spaces as places that just incorporate, um, you know, places of rest for the dead. Um, and what's also interesting about these spaces is historically, um, cemeteries, you know, would have promenades every single Sunday. People would drive their cars throughout the property, they'd pull out blankets and picnic. And so I want to um, help facilitate and create a visual environment that invites people into the green space um, behind the fence line. Um, the next piece that you can go to, if you'll back out to the gallery um, section, will be this 2020. Um, so first the zoomed out version, and then I'll go into the zoomed in version. So this piece is called It's Complicated. And you know, I mentioned that my work um, for, pardon me everyone, um, is a reflection of um, racial tensions that existed between um, uh, the historic Buffalo Soldiers of 124th Infantry as well as Houston police officers in 1917. And also thinking through you know, just the realities of being a black man in America today, um, the experiences that many people still face um, even now. And so this piece is called It's Complicated um, because here in 2020 we are, um, and we're seeing much of the same um, realities that we saw then. And I hope that my work from, uh, for pardon me everyone, can in many ways be a reflection to us of where we've come from um, so that we don't necessarily have to go back there. Um, now, if you'll go to the next zoomed in version, I'll show specifically why um, this piece is um, prominent or specific to this work. Um, in my final piece, um, I'm utilizing um, acrylic and reflective material almost in um, a very, um, uh, how do I want to say this? Um, in a way in which I'm trying to um, reveal things, I, I want there to be space for reflection, um, but I also want there to be space for people to have to um, look closely. Um, it's when you stand and look closely at something that you actually have enough time to be with it. Um, and in being with something, then you actually have enough time to um, choose. Um, choose how you will respond, choose if you will um, support um, the effort to help these individuals be part of history. Um, but specifically, I also want to point out the juxtaposition that I'm utilizing um, with the contrast of um, hard shape, um, geometry, um, and color. And yeah, so if you'll go from that one, we can go to back out and we can go to scroll all the way up. And let's go to the first uh, black circle image. So this work is titled Hold Up. Um, it's a piece that I have installed at Project Row Houses right now. Um, it's a reference um, and a, a celebration um, and also a memorial for the lives of Botham Jean and Tatiana Jefferson. Um, the, if you go to the next um, image, Sophie, um, the work um, places itself in an Afrofuture sixth dimension um, that imagines a possibility where um, Tatiana Jefferson and Botham Jean are both um, with us here. Um, and they're also both with um, wherever they are today. And thinking of those two places being at the same time is really um, healing for me. Um, so I think through the lives that we lose so often in the Black community um, for so many of the same reasons. Um, and so as I explored this piece, 
um, I knew that in many ways um, I was getting closer and closer to um, the work that would be existing um, that will be installed at, Project, at, at uh, College Memorial Park Cemetery. And if you'll back out um, and go to the top image, the center image up there. Awesome. So um, this, will, this is a mock-up of what the final work will be looked like. There will be 13 panels um, that are approximately 48 by 96 inches that cover the perimeter fence of College Memorial Park Cemetery. And each of these panels um, will have a reflective material in the back. Um, and then each of them will also include hexagons that form into a circle. Um, the hexagon is the strongest shape um, and the hexagon is found in nature. And so placing um, this work out in public, um, you know, placing it where it's exposed, I want it to create an element um, of strength for the work that could almost be embedded um, in, in, in a, almost a, uh, I don't know. I, I just know that I wanted the work to be protected. Um, there's previously a memorial that existed for Camp Logan, um, located at Memorial Park that was defaced in 2017. And so as I think through my work, um, and the topics that I'm speaking through, um, the potentials that exist you know, for public art, um, what happens um, when you know, you're challenging different narratives, um, I wanted to create something that um, as people engage the work, no matter who you are, um, whether you're engaging the work because you find beauty in it, or you're engaging the work because there's conflict within you, um, the reflection, at least, um, has you looking back at yourself. Um, and then um, each of these works will include one of the corporals, um, as I was mentioning, from the Houston 13. Um, and specifically, there is a circle inside of this hexagon shape. Um, and that's just kind of a personal reference um, for one of my favorite albums um, from Stevie Wonder. Um, and that album, um, the name of the album is called In a Square Circle, and in the album, Stevie Wonder has this really beautiful song called Spiritual Walkers. Um, and in the song, um, Stevie Wonder talks about um, this idea of people being with us um, here now um, that come, they come to show us light. And I think that um, in many ways, our ancestors, um, those that have come before us, you know, uh, they're here to show us the light. They're here to show us um, where we've come from again so that we don't have to return so yeah that's kind of a, a summary of my of my work um, i'm really excited for it to be installed and uh, yeah thank you so much michael um so i guess now let's jump into um a little bit of discussion and if you have questions now is a great time to put them into the facebook live so we can ask israel and michael um, so we discussed a little bit beforehand about what we wanted to talk about in our discussion and Israel brought up the really excellent point of just this entire pandemic situation. I know it's overused, but it is unprecedented. I think that that is a, a proper way to talk about this. Um, and I think that the pandemic has provided new layers of meaning for both Israel and Michael's pieces first and kind of most surface level in that creating and installing public art is has taken on kind of new levels of difficulty um, and has made us rethink the ways in which we put something into public space. Um, are we keeping ourselves and our fabricators and our team safe? Um, those new levels of difficulty, um, I don't think that the public are really aware of. So it would be great to hear from both of you about that. But also another thing is that both of your projects um, reference the Black Houstonian experience. Um, and one thing that COVID has really um, underscored further is the levels of inequality, um, racial inequality that we face in our society. Right, so um, Black Americans are much more likely to contract the virus and are also much more likely to um, die from the sickness. So that is partially due to um, 
income inequality, people having to go to work, uh, being unable to work from home, that's due to lack of quality care. Um, it's due to a whole range of levels and systems of inequality. Um, and so I'm wondering not only how has the virus affected your kind of logistic met like practice, um, the ways in which you're trying to get your work done, and also how has the virus changed the way in which you're thinking of serving the community with this work? Like has it, has it at all, and if it has in what way, changed the way that your art is sort of operating in the public sphere? Um, Israel, do you wanna go first? Sure. Thanks. Well, interestingly enough, the whole COVID um, dynamic is something that if you, if you study it, you'll see that it is something that there's a evolutionary process. It's evolving into something. There is no stagnation in terms of its presence and its impact. So funny story. When I had slated my installation date, the same day, that particular day, we were informed that I believe, um, I think uh, there had been some type of decision, a municipal from City Hall that, yes, that's what it was. Um, I think that as of 12 o'clock, yes, that's when they first mandated it would be the stay at home. And so there was this, you know, this hysteria and this pandemonium and everybody was really excited and besides themselves with anxiety. Oh, you know, it's getting increasingly worse. And my first response was, okay, well, and plus you guys, Art League had already at that point extended the uh, installation and the project as a whole had been greatly impacted and compromised as a result of it. My initial response was, okay, well, I guess I better just, you know, wait and, and uh, you know, we'll just have to ride this out. And I, I had uh, went so far as went through my fabricator and told him, well, look, uh, they're going to institute, they're going to establish the stay at home. Uh, Houston's going to lock down as of 12 midnight. <laughs> so I had a uh, Called my wife and I told her, well, yeah, this is, this is what's going to happen 12 midnight. And she said, uh, she asked me over the phone, she said, uh, is, is, is your uh, fabricator sick? I said, no. Uh, she said, are you sick? And I said, no. She said, then get, get, the, get the art up. <laughs> so she was very, very uh, adamant and very uh, assertive about get the art up. And that for me has been somewhat of a, 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 uh, a guidepost, if you will. And the particular day that we put the art up, we installed was the same day again that the media had just kind of inundated the public with this information that as of 12 midnight, um, you know, the city's gonna lock down. And so everybody just had this really kind of dismal uh, 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 outlook of you know, what was going to ultimately you know, come of uh, Houston, their lives, period. But as we were installing the art, the response was so overwhelmingly positive and the people reciprocated the, um, the inclusion of this, this new uh, element in their neighborhood to the extent that, again, as I mentioned earlier, they were just extremely positive and excited. And uh, it's a, it was a very beautiful uh, spiritual reciprocity, if you will. So I say that to say that, yes, um, external pre-existing dynamics will be but art is something that is uh, very organic. It is very timely and very timeless. And it is something that the artist has to recognize as a tool and a mechanism for healing and for distraction and for elevation in times of crises and in times of uncertainty. So it is important for me as an artist to continue to create and produce relevant and, and uh, life-affirming artwork uh, not only for my own uh, energy and my own spiritual well-being, but certainly for the public and for humanity as a whole, because this is something that is needed. And not to, um, you know, not to come down on any particular uh, genre or, or institution, but the media, unfortunately, has a, a habit of kind of just locking onto sound bites, and this is all that the people hear. 
we just kind of hear these same sound bites over and over. And so we have to, we have to explain, we have to utilize our, our tools, our assets, our gifts as, as creative individuals to, to kind of circumvent that and to do the work that is higher. And I'm a constant uh, advocate of higher vibration operating on a higher vibration, creating works of art, literature, uh, performance, anything that raises the vibration of humanity and of those who uh, experience the work. So um, fortunately, I've been blessed. Uh, since COVID, I've been working steadily. <laughs> and I just attribute that to the fact that, you know, the thing about being a freelance and a, a, a self-employed artist you can put in bids, you can knock doors on Monday or on, uh, 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 say, for example, in June, and you may not get a response until ju till July or August. And so since this is something that I'm constantly and always doing, you know, constantly chomp chomping at the bit, a lot of that, the seeds that I have sown, you know, I'm harvesting that now. And of course, there is a sector, there is a large population that are you know, without a doubt impacted by, you know, this thing. You have people who are certainly impacted in a very negative way, people who have lost their jobs and whose uh, economics are just, you know, in dire straits. And I have a tremendous amount of empathy, you know, for those individuals. But I'm saying in the same sense that we as artists, we cannot shelve or table uh, our creativity because of what is going on externally. We have to find ways to, again, utilize our gifts for the sake of and for the, um, the benefit of the masses. This is very important. Once we understand our roles as, as creative individuals and artisans, how do we incorporate that into the, the, the larger picture uh, so that ultimately it is a benefit and our services and our existence is a benefit and not a detriment you know, to society. So, that's my take on that. I think that it's really important for us to understand, yes, this whole COVID thing is very real. Uh, we don't know how this way out, but we cannot push the pause button at this point and say, well, uh, because of this, then I'll have to do that. We have to navigate around this. This is a terrain that particularly as African-American artists, we are not unfamiliar with. We have faced ob obstacles from the word go. So it's imperative that again, we just be very creative uh, not only with the canvas and in the studio, but also in how we view and facilitate uh, our role in society. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Israel. Yeah, I remember when you first got your piece up, I went out to look at it. And even though I don't have any like real personal ties to Acres Homes, other than just being a Houstonian, um, I was like energized for a week by just looking at your incredible work and it was it was super uplifting to in a time that is really just frankly scary and the unknowns are scary the knowns are scary everything's scary um, to see a piece that is like really about continuity and resilience and the like fertility of a place um, in terms of the strength and beauty and um, legacy of a whole community. It was, it was really incredible, so thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Michael, would you like to respond? Absolutely, um, and I also wanna say that I, I had an opportunity to see Israel's work as well. Um, I used to spend my summers at my second job out of college um, running summer camps for kids at Set of Gas. And just knowing that like, kids in that community get to see um, work that's that cool, I'm really excited for. Um, what I'll say is as an artist um, in this experience of COVID, I think that the minute everything shut down, like things for me actually um, got maxed up. Um, at the moment, I happen to be installing work um, at Project Real Houses and I also um, am the marketing associate at Writers in the Schools, um, which is a local nonprofit here in Houston. And so um, I suddenly kind of began blurring my professional life and my creative life at the exact same time. Um, and then in the process of kind of doing that, there's also um, continuing to work through um, what my installation at College Memorial Park Cemetery would be. And so um, I love work. Um, I love that I'm in a position um, 
in my life today where I get to wake up in the morning and work, where I get to wake up in the morning and create, um, where I have the privilege of knowing that like my mind um, and others around me can take an idea from concept into reality. And I don't take that lightly. And so um, throughout this experience of COVID, um, this time that's been, um, you know, in some ways given, if you look at it with glass half full, um, and in some ways required. Um, I've used both the requirements and what's given um, to the best of my ability to continue to be in creation um, for the sake of creation itself. Um, I know that right now, kind of similar to echoing what Israel was saying, that um, you know, at 33, I'm planting seeds um, that in many ways I may not see for years to come. Um, and I also realize that um, the things I'm experiencing right now are from seeds that I planted years ago that I don't even remember. Um, however, um, what I know um, in this experience as a Black artist in COVID is that um, we have a unique responsibility to continue to show our community um, what inspiration can look like in these times, um, what beacons of hope can look like in these times, that even though we're in an environment and a world and a media world specifically that's um, continuing to say that um, <laughs> either we don't matter or that would like to see us not exist, um, that we have the right and that we're also finding the support um, from organizations like the City of Houston um, to create work to reflect back to us um, just how important we are and so uh, yeah that's been my overall reflection kind of every, everything that's been happening um, and I'll say that you know with this experience with COVID um, there's so many friends I've been speaking with and my encouragement just to all of them is just I'm meant to breathe um, like this is a lot and I don't have you know instructions for how everyone's supposed to get through it because everyone has a unique set of circumstances, but I do understand that um, taking like just some moments just to breathe um, can really start to cultivate a lot of peace within. Um, and so, yeah, if we can all just start telling people around us to breathe, um, it might be interesting what, you know, a city of 7 million people all looking at one another saying breathe uh, might feel like. Um, and so in all, that's just kind of been um, my internal dialogue throughout the experience of COVID um, for the most part. Um, to fight off those moments that, yeah, it can get hard. It can get kind of downright shitty, honestly. Um, and staying hopeful and positive, um, high vibration, absolutely. Thank you. That's really beautiful, the collective breath. I love that. Yeah. Um, I know that Sarah has been receiving some questions from Facebook. So Israel and Michael, if you're okay with that, I think we'll... Um, ask Sarah to read some of those for us. Thanks, Sophie. Uh, and thanks, Israel Michael, for this great discussion. And also thank you to everyone out there uh, who's listening and chiming in. So we've got a couple here. Uh, and this actually may be more of a question kind of for Sophie in general about the project. But Vinod Hobson, hey, Vinod, thanks for chiming in. Um, wants to know if these installations will be permanent and that uh, Vinod would love seeing a lasting memorial. But Sophie, maybe you could kind of talk a little bit about the logistics of how long these installations and everything will be on view. Oh, you're muted, Sophie. Thanks. Um, sure. Thanks, Vinod, for the question. Um, so the way that the grant from the city works is that the projects are designated as temporary art. So anything on city of Houston land has to, um, it is permitted through a temporary art permit, which is kind of the maximum amount of time is nine months. Um, that is from like stepping foot on the property to removing the last of the art. Um, so Israel's piece, for instance, is on the public right of way. So maximum it can be on the land, um, which is including installation and deinstallation, is nine months, which is why we've said on view for eight months that allows the artist some time to put in foundations and then get the piece up, then it's on view, and then they'll have time to deinstall over time. Um, pieces like Michael's, um, Michael's piece is on private land. So for the sake of the project, we're saying that everything is temporary. Um, but if an artist has a work on private land, they can come to an agreement with the property owner um, and that piece could become permanent. However, any piece on public land is uh, definitely temporary. 
Thanks, Sarah. Awesome. And then we do have another question uh, from Mariah Rockefeller. Hey, Mariah. Uh, and this is for both Israel and Michael. So maybe we'll kick off with Israel first and then move to Michael if they'd like to respond. Uh, Mariah asks, I'm curious about challenges and or surprises you encountered during the research process as you were developing your proposal and kind of what you were going to create. Um, again, I think, uh, as I mentioned initially, my challenge was purely from a creative uh, perspective. What do I create? Uh, how do I approach this blank canvas? And um, ultimately, what will be the most effective visual mechanism um, that will have the duration, as Sophie mentioned, of a nine month uh, lifespan. And so I ultimately decided to do the rocking chairs specifically on the right of way in the medium because I wanted the maximum visual impact the people driving to and fro where they could not ignore or nor avoid the presence of this artwork, of this, uh, this entity, if you will, sitting there, speaking to them, reaching out and resonating. So that was the only challenge that I had in terms was just how do I approach it uh, from a, a uh, creative standpoint. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, when I met with um, fabricators initially that Art League introduced me to, and forgive me for forgetting their names, but we had decided, well, maybe we shouldn't do rocking chairs because I initially wanted the rocking chairs to be mobile for people to actually be able to uh, access them and sit in them. And then I thought, no, uh, after our dialogue, that from a uh, public health standpoint and safety, that would not uh, work because of the uh, possibility, of course, of injury, children, et cetera. And I did not want to draw the people to the art uh, and have it interactive in a physical way. So I decided early on to restrict them to just structural components that could be viewed and experienced uh, visually. So once I more or less just kind of fine tuned the technical aspect of it, um, it was pretty much a relatively simple process uh, in terms of, again, I wanted this to be a combination not only of aesthetics, but I also wanted it to be something that was um, viable and um, uh, functionary. So this is why I came up with the concept of the giant A. I wanted to create something that was a totem, if you will. So when the people are driving into the community, here is this huge, uh, larger than life A, which is an, an announcement. And I more or less equate this to uh, historically, you'll, you have situations or dynamics where you'll find yourself in a particular territory or a different uh, community or, 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 or terrain. Uh, tribal, or, uh, indigenous people, they had a way of marking the turf. So I wanted to create something that would announce that you are now in Acres Home 44. And I thought of no better way to do that than to construct and design a huge uh, towering A. And I decided to step, go a step further, particularly being a, uh, a spoken word artist uh, and poet. And I went ahead and utilized a poem on the piece, which reads, for those of you who haven't seen it, uh, some roses bloom from, uh, some roses bloom from concrete roughness, defying the odds with thorny toughness. From trials and challenges, strength is grown. This is the beauty of Acres Homes. So I wanted to tie that in, this mixed media piece, and at the same time, make it a definitive uh, expression of who Acres Homes is and what its residents are all about in terms of their resilience and their determination to thrive and move forward in spite of uh, cultural appropriation and gentrification and all these different dynamics of just social erosion, but still have this element of, of triumph and survival. So for me, that basically was the uh, kind of the gist of uh, my, my motivation for the installation. Thanks. Thank you, Israel. Uh, so Mike, I think we'll turn it over to you if you have a response to the question as well. And it was just, again, what challenges and or surprises 
did you come across along the way? Absolutely. Um, I have two specific ones. Um, one, which is um, actually deeply personal. So, you know, my work references, you know, obviously the uh, black soldiers from uh, the Buffalo Soldiers, 124th Infantry, uh, and also Houston police officers. And um, right when I, I, I thought that I was really, um, I guess this was at some point in December of last year, of 2019, uh, or November, really finding a stride with the work. Um, one of my closest friends, um, uh, Houston police officer, uh, Sergeant Christopher Brewster, um, passed away um, while I was working on the project. And so um, naturally that, that provided um, a decent amount of disconnect for me with um, my engagement with how, how I was to um, incorporate um, police into the work, because honestly, um, initially the work did incorporate um, that visual juxtaposition. Um, however, along the way, um, that process led me to getting to um, what the work was truly about. And again, the, the work is, is truly about the Houston 13, um, not so much um, an us versus them, um, but more specifically looking at um, these men and their lives and saying that their lives matter um, and the crimes that were committed, um, uh, the crimes that they were charged for, um, that there should be forgiveness um, for everyone. Um, and then number two, um, I guess it's kind of a part of that same thing is that, you know, um, being a, I, being a young artist, you know, again, I'm just gonna call myself a young artist, I'm 33 years old. Um, I'm very much, um, this process, you know, um, of placing a public sculpture um, at a very important place in the city has been, um, you know, pretty monumental as you could imagine. And I've really wanted to go about it correctly. Um, and I've also wanted to go about it in a way that really felt um, authentic and genuine. And so I would say um, some of the hardest things have just kind of been like sorting through um, what is me, what's genuine and like what's not. And I, I think that um, the work that I've finally um, been able to land on and create um, that will be installed on July 12th um, is a complete representation of me that honors um, this rich history um, of the Buffalo Soldiers um, and also the work that still has to be done for the future. Thanks so much. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Michael. Um, I think that's probably about the time we have for today. Um, one more thing, Sarah has just put it in the chat, but um, a website where you can find more of Michael's work is alotaland.com. Um, so check that out if you have the chance. Uh, like I said, the link's in the chat. And also the link to Israel's website, israelmcleodstudio.com should be in the chat as well. Um, a big thank you to everyone who is watching. Um, we're really grateful for the support for the project and for these incredible artists um support local artists support your local arts institutions um like you've heard here these artists really want to support the community and they can't do that without your support so please um also big thanks to israel and michael um for joining us today we really appreciate your time um and your wise words um, I think that's all. If anybody has any last thoughts, now's the time. I uh, got a New York second. If you Listen, okay. real quick. <laughs> Again, I just want to, my, 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 my daughter is always emphasizing, Dad, you know, tell people about your, your website, your website. She's working on that. As I mentioned early on, you know, I, I am the, the uh, Barney Rubble of the group here. So I've been doing this since 1967, uh, old school style, you know, and, uh, I'm still going strong. I want to emphasize something that's very important to echo what you've been saying, uh, you know, and hats off to young, young artists like Michael uh, and, and so many more. Support the artists. It's, in, it's incredible. This is the last medium that remains for us to take advantage of in terms of, again, uh, the uplifting of, of, of society, our people, humanity, art. You know, every day is a blank canvas. We have an opportunity to create something very beautiful. Uh, the mediums are, are completely, the categories are just, there is no limit on that, whether it's literature, whether it's performance art, whether it's visual art. Support your local artists, uh, lend your, 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 your businesses, your walls to the muralists, and let's define our neighborhoods and our communities and stop complaining about what isn't and focus on what is and what we can do from a proactive standpoint.
Thank you. Thanks so much, Israel. Um, if that's all, um, again, big thank you. And we hope to see you again soon. All right. Um, Sarah, do you have any last words? That's it. I'll go ahead and um, end everything. And thank you all so much. We'll have another one of these coming very soon. Just check um, Art League's Facebook for info. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all.